Hey there, my fellow intellectuals. How are you doing today? Kyle here with another video. And as the academic year approaches us here at the University of California, Irvine, and may have already started for you at your own institution, I wanted to make a video talking about the things that I wish I knew before starting my own PhD program. For those of you who are new to my channel and may not know, I am a fifth year PhD candidate at the University of California, Irvine. Technically, I'll be starting my fifth year at the start of this academic year in like three weeks, but essentially a fifth year. And I wanted to make this video because I know there's a lot of incoming graduate students who are excited and are really um, hyped to start their programs. And that's great. And I just want to give a little bit of advice to those of you who may not know the entire PhD process and what to expect. And I by no means know everything, but I know a few things just because I've been here for four years and I want to share some of that with you. So I just wrote down a list of 11 things that I wish I knew before starting my PhD. And this is in no particular order, it's just a list I just generated this morning when I was thinking about it. And I'm gonna go ahead and share what those things are. But I also encourage anyone who is in a PhD program themselves to leave a comment and you know add anything that you think I may have missed or things that you, you, you yourself consider are valuable to know before starting a PhD program because that will really uh, add value to this video as well. So anyway, let's go ahead and begin. So the first thing I have written down here is, you don't have to keep researching the topic you did in undergrad, it's okay to try something new. And that was definitely my case. So when I was an undergrad at UC Merced, I studied experimental condensed matter physics, and because that was the thing I did for my bachelor's thesis, I did it for two years, and I really got to know it well. I went to a conference and presented on my topic twice, um, I really felt tied to that topic and I felt that I had to keep doing that in graduate school. So when I applied to graduate school and got into UC Irvine, I thought I would keep doing experimental condensed matter. And I kept looking around for people to work with and I just got the vibe that, you know, I really wasn't that attached to what I did as an undergraduate. And because that was sort of the only thing available to me as an undergrad coming from a small school, going to a bigger school, there was just a lot more opportunities to do different stuff and a lot of that other stuff appealed to me more than what I had done previously. And so I decided to switch into astrophysics. I have a couple of videos about that process on my channel. I can link some of them in the description below. I want everyone to know that it's totally okay to try something new. I had no experience in astrophysics whatsoever before I switched to it uh, at the start of my, uh, I guess, second quarter at UC Irvine. And now, you know, four years later, I'm getting ready to publish um, some papers in astrophysics and you know I've learned um, you know essentially from nothing so uh, it's definitely possible to try something new not to say that you can't stay if you want to stay you know definitely stay but just know that you aren't just fixed to what you started as an undergraduate okay number two so the number two thing I wrote down here is not all PhD advisors are created equal so this is a topic that I've talked uh, a bit in depth on uh, PhD balances channel I'll put a uh, I guess a thumbnail to that video and the link in the description below where I talked about different things to look for in a PhD advisor when you're choosing one. And I also have a video on questions that I use to ask different potential advisors just to help sort of screen uh, which people I wanted to work with. Some advisors are going to be very supportive, going to be very attentive, going to regularly check up on you and your progress. And there will be others who don't and who don't really um, have a good reputation of developing their graduate students into professional scientists. And if you talk to the graduate students in your program who are a little bit older, you, you could easily figure out who those people are and who to, and who to try and st steer clear of. So it's a very important process. Since I've gotten into depth before multiple times, I won't go any further than that. But just know that um, it's a very important part of your PhD journey, uh, selecting your PhD advisor, and you should really do your due diligence in selecting them. Okay, so the third thing I wrote down is that most of the learning happens outside the classroom. So I should have probably learned this in undergraduate because I did a lot of that in undergrad where you know I did a lot of learning outside the class, but I would say for the most part, most of the classes in undergrad, I did learn a fair amount in the classroom. I was really engaged with the professors and I really did enjoy um, spending time there. I also came from a semester school system, which was a 16-week system for an academic um, semester. And then I went to UC Irvine, which is a 10-week quarter system. 
Uh, so the information was just much more rushed and condensed. And that's exactly what I felt like in my new uh, graduate school environment where, you know, a 16 week semester let me digest the material uh, more slowly and at my own pace. Whereas in a 10 week system, I just, it was just kind of like information being thrown at me left and right. And I'm just sort of freaking out that I have a midterm uh, in like week three and it's, it's just, you know, it, it just was coming at me so fast that I really don't think I learned that much in the classroom at UC Irvine, if I'm going to be honest. Like, no offense to the professors who taught the class. I don't really think it's a problem with them. It's just more like the, the, the system that we're in just did not allow me to really digest the material at the rate that is comfortable for me in the classroom. And hence, I had to spend a lot of the time outside the classroom trying to learn the stuff that was in the classroom. And maybe that's not the case for everyone. Uh, some people might be able to just uh, do fine in the quarter system in a, in a 10 week quarter system. Um, but for me, uh, definitely I learned a lot of the stuff, um, you know, late at night or at Starbucks or in the library, um, for my classes in order to get decent grades in graduate school. So that's one thing I <laughs> did not see coming though, maybe with a little bit of extrapolation from undergraduate, I probably could have figured out, but yeah, uh, a lot of the learning, I'd say probably like more than three quarters of the learning, happened outside the classroom. Okay, so number four I have is it's easy to get involved with extracurriculars and spread yourself too thin. And when I came to UC Irvine, um, at least in our school, in our department, there were a lot of programs and outreach opportunities and stuff that are um, extra to what a normal graduate student would normally get themselves in. And I'm the kind of person who gets really attracted when people are offering, hey, you know, join this, join that. Like, it, we could really use your help, uh, you know, th those kinds of environments. Kind of like in clubs um, in undergraduate, if you've ever been to like those you know, club fairs where every club is sort of pitching ideas at you. It kind of it kind of felt that way, at least when I first got to my graduate program, that there were a lot of things that graduate students could do outside of their PhD. And... I did take on a few uh, different responsibilities outside of my uh, PhD, a few extra extra curriculars. Um, and it's just in my nature to do that. And I kind of had to realize at a certain point that I was doing a lot, right? Like I was trying to do this YouTube channel on top of, um, you know, trying to be a PhD student and doing outreach and being part of like essentially like student government for our, uh, for our physics um, graduate cohort. And, you know, all of that combined, it just was taking so much time away from the real reason why I met UC Irvine, which is you know to get my PhD, do quality research, um, and I had to really prioritize the things that I felt were most important. Um, of course, the YouTube channel being one of them. You know, you guys are a priority. I mean, ultimately, it's it's very important to to take a step back and really prioritize your time. And the things you get yourself involved in, because um, if you're not careful, you can really uh, lose progress and time on your PhD and your thesis. So the next thing that I have on my list here is that there are other options besides academia for PhDs. Now, when I was an undergraduate and even now as a graduate student uh, starting my fifth year soon, I still ultimately want to become uh, an academic professor at a university. Um, though, as I have gone through graduate school, I've seen that there are a lot of other opportunities for PhDs besides academia. There are government jobs or national labs. There are, you know, industry jobs in data science. Um, a lot of people in physics go into finance. Um, people go work in nonprofits. Uh, you know, there is a lot, a lot of other things people can do with their PhDs that that does not involve becoming a university professor. And I really just didn't know that b before I started my PhD. I really just had a one-track sort of mind with what you could do with a PhD. And I think it's good for people to realize that there are so many things that they can do that are fulfilling and worthwhile besides becoming an academic professor. And I have opened myself up to the possibility that, you know, maybe I won't end up being a university professor, but that's okay because I know that there are other opportunities for me that I think I can succeed and thrive in. So I would say keep your options open when you are in graduate school. It can be very easy if you're really fixated on becoming a 
professor that that's the only thing you're going to accept and that you're not going to settle for anything less. But I would say that it's important to know what else is out there and to at least consider the possibility that you might not stay in academia for the rest of your life. And that's just my own um, personal opinion. Okay, so number six on my list here is teaching and mentoring undergrads can be time consuming, but extremely rewarding. Now, this is just from my own personal experience. I have been a TA several times um, at UC Irvine, and I've also mentored three different undergraduates over the past three summers, um, where they would essentially use the programs that I've written in Python to try and uh, do some science with our um, our data with the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. So essentially, for those of you who don't know, I essentially weigh um, how massive black holes are at the center of galaxies. And the students I've worked with, um, actually the past two, have made the very first ever measurement of uh, the mass of these black holes in the galaxies that they worked in. And I find it just so gratifying to see someone you know who comes in new to our research field and um, you know really makes an effort to learn and I can see them grow and progress and I can help them understand uh, certain pitfalls and certain difficult ideas uh, and really see them thrive and become a, uh, a really competent young scientist. Um, and that also goes in the classroom as well. I really like seeing people who you know, really want to learn physics, who really uh, care about the material and want to have a better understanding. And I can help cultivate that and help um, you know, turn that light bulb on in their, in their mind to, to a certain idea or a certain problem. So I find it very, very rewarding. I know not everyone does, but I, I do see the value in um, sort of training the next uh, generation of, um, of students and scientists. So uh, yeah, that's, that's my take on that. Number seven, it's easy to let the academic world take over your life. Make time to talk to friends, family, and loved ones who aren't in academia to help keep you grounded and put things into perspective. So that was kind of long, but essentially the main point of that is that when you're in graduate school and you're really into your work, which is a great thing, it can be very easy to get lost and think that your university and your sort of area of research is all there is to life. And it can be easy to forget that there are, you know, things outside of that. Um, I know I definitely am guilty of doing that, where I just get so focused on like, oh, you know, these issues that are happening in the field of black hole mass measurements and you know, it, it seems like it's the most, you know, uh, critical issues in the world at the moment to me. But in reality, you know, there are other things going on. And I think it's really important to stay grounded and to remember that there is a world outside of academia that a lot of people don't know about or really even care about. And not to say that you should care about it less, but you should just acknowledge that, you know, there is more to life than just a career, a job, and... um you know, to not think that just because you're doing something that is uh, not common means you're, you know, free of, um, you know, caring about the, the rest of the world. And that, it, that, that you know, by, by virtue of your position of being in a PhD program makes you better or worse than anyone else. I mean, I think that's ultimately just what I'm trying to, um, to convey here. Because I think a lot of people, not a lot of people, but, you know, there, there are a few people who... Um, I think can let academia take over their life and just, you know, be completely ignorant of everything that's happening outside of it. So just try not to let that happen. Number eight, networking with your peers in academia is important, <laughs> is important, comma, I didn't put anything else, but yeah, networking with your peers in academia is important. Before I got into graduate school, I didn't really be that active on like YouTube or Twitter or Instagram or whatever. And there are some pitfalls to being on social media too much. I've definitely been guilty of spending way too much time on social media and letting it get to me and having it ruin my mood. But there are benefits to having a presence online. And I understand if everyone is not comfortable doing that, but I just would like people to know that I have learned of, you know, for example, internships, summer schools, fellowship opportunities, job openings, conferences that I wouldn't have known otherwise had I not been on certain social media platforms. So, you know, given all of the potential pitfalls and um, drawbacks to being on social media, there are benefits to them. And I think it's 
it's really managing your time wisely and knowing you know what to look at and what not to look at and um, you know fostering good connections with people that you genuinely find interesting I mean I've met a lot of people on social media who I, I just knew through social media but then I met them in person and, and they've become really good uh, contacts and friends in my life and I'm just really grateful that I had the opportunity to do that and um, even collaborate with some of them making some of these videos some of you may know um, so I it's it's really been a pleasure to have networked and been on social media and connected with really cool amazing people and uh, potentially even make content with them and um, I definitely think that for me as someone who is getting closer to the end of my PhD um, having this network of people that I know uh, it puts my mind a little bit at ease knowing that, okay, you know, I know people at different institutions, at different national labs, at different organizations that, you know, when the time comes for me to start, you know, looking for uh, then my next job, you know, I, I will have people I know in places that I might want to go to, right? I'm not saying that they're just going to hand out the job to me for free, but at least I, I have people um, that I know in those areas that I could reach out to and get advice from. So that's uh, what I have to say about networking. Number nine. Finding the time for your hobbies is hard, but necessary. Yes, so in graduate school, it can be very time consuming as we've already talked about. And it can be very easy to just let go of all the things that sort of make you who you are, right? I mean, um, especially during this pandemic, I lost a lot of parts of myself that I, I'm really sad about, but I've been trying to work back up. For So for example, I kind of, wasn't maintaining my physical health. I used to be very, very active and going to the gym and whatnot. And so I've been trying to get back into that. I used to really like playing my piano because I, I grew up playing piano. And even though I don't get lessons anymore and perform, I, I still like just playing it for fun. And it's just nice to lose myself in the music and the songs that I still know how to play. And, um, you know, my hobbies have really allowed me to just escape the stresses sometimes of my work and especially if I'm just stuck and really just can't bear to dedicate more mental energy to some of these problems I'm working on it's nice to just pick up the guitar or the piano and just start playing and just lose myself in that activity uh, and let my mind just relax and do something you know therapeutic to to it and um, I think whatever your hobbies are whatever makes you happy outside of your job um, you should definitely try and keep doing that uh, even, you know, in the midst of your PhD, even though it can be hard. So that's what I have to say about the hobbies. Let's do number 10, which is, it's extremely easy to compare yourself with your peers, but you need to learn how to focus solely on your own PhD journey. And so this can essentially be summed up as don't compare yourself with other people. Um, and while that's kind of obvious, I think it's very hard to do because, especially me as someone who's just naturally a very competitive person. For those of you who don't know, I'm very competitive. Um, ask any of my friends growing up how competitive I was with sports and playing games and whatnot. Um, it can be just all too easy to see what your peers are doing um, and, you know, what journals they're publishing in and what fellowships they've won and, you know, look at yourself and say, oh, I, I haven't done any of that. So, you know, I must not be that good as a student. And, this is also one of the drawbacks of social media where, you know, you can see everyone's uh, achievement who's not even at your own school, right? So you can see so-and-so at, you know, University X getting a grant or, you know, so-and-so from University Y, uh, you know, is getting featured in this news article, right? Ever, right? And you can you can easily trick yourself into thinking, wow, I'm, I'm not that amazing because I'm not doing all those things. And, you know, everyone's journey in their PhD is going to be unique and different and I think one of the things that's helped me stay happy in my PhD is to really just take pride in what I've done so far and know that, you know, I'm working in my area of research that's completely separate from everyone else's. And I've been very happy to have the advisors and the mentors that I've had um, and, you know, who have genuinely given me good advice and um, given me praise for the work that I've done. Um, and that's not just, you know, that's not being shown anywhere in news articles or anything like that, but I don't care. You know, it's, it's learning how to take pride in your own accomplishments, even when no one else is really looking at it other than the people who are really close to you. And 
everyone, like I said, is everyone's going to go through a different journey. Everyone has a different PhD advisor. Everyone has a different funding situation. Everyone has a different goal in life as to what they want to achieve. And I think it's just extremely important to remember the things that make you fulfilled. And if you're meeting that and you are, um, you know, attaining the, uh, the status and the goals that you set for yourself, then that's all really that you need. And you don't really need to, you know, all this extra stuff and don't need to think about what you don't have, um, but focus, more focus on what you do have. So hope that made sense. Don't compare yourself with others. Yeah, essentially, just focus on yourself. Don't care too much about what other people do. And that will make graduate school much more bearable. Last thing on my list is friendships are what makes doing a PhD bearable even in the worst of times. So doing a physics PhD has been one of the most stressful and intellectually challenging things I have ever done in my entire life. And that's just the PhD part. The other parts of my life, like in my personal life, there have been things that have really gone wrong over the past four years that have really stressed me out, have really made me sad, have really made me angry, have really um, taken a lot of my energy away from my PhD. And, you know, when you're in a very stressful situation, like being in a physics PhD, and then you have, you know, the stresses of life on top of that, it can, it can get pretty unbearable at times. And I'm just so happy and blessed that I've made friends in my PhD who have just appreciated me for who I am and have, you know, talked with me and um, helped me through some of the worst times of my life during the past four years. Not saying the PhD is the worst thing I've ever done, but I've had some really terrible moments over the past four years that um, without my friends, I just don't even know where I'd be right now. Like, I don't know if I'd still be in the program if it weren't for the conversations I've had and I've had the support and affection from the friends who um, helped me through those dark times. And um, it, it also feels good knowing that I'm there for them in their you know dark moments during their PhD when things just don't go right in their life and um, we can support each other through a hard time. So I definitely highly recommend trying to connect and make good friends during your PhD, um, which I think it's made a little bit easier just because everyone kind of acknowledges this in the first year. It's a, it's a very stressful thing and you're all taking these classes and whatnot and it's... Um, you know, you're all sort of in this situation together. But I think cultivating that and really honing and developing those friendships a little bit further beyond the classroom uh, can really liven up and make, you know, even the worst times bearable. So I know this was a long video. I hope you enjoyed watching it. It was um, a pleasure to make, even though I may have stumbled on my words here and there a bit. But I, I really hope you found this video useful and uh, leave a comment below if you did and if especially if you are also doing your own graduate program leave a comment below giving your own advice to incoming new graduate students that you think you wish you had known yourself and if you haven't already uh, please consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell down below so you can get notified when i upload future videos and with that i will be heading off and i hope you all have a great day take it easy everyone